great. Welcome. Thank you for coming, everybody. Um, my name is Debbie Barker, and I'm serving as the international coordinator for a newly formed organization called the International Coalition on Climate and Agriculture, also known as ICCA. And um, the ICCA was formed um, to help lend a voice uh, to the critical issue to show that there's such a critical link between agriculture and food systems and climate. And as we know, our current industrial agriculture system is responsible for at least 30% of total greenhouse gas emissions. And yet it's been very little discussed um, in climate fora. It, and we want to just lend a voice to strengthen that um, movement, those movements. Um, today, we're gonna be talking about uh, some of the problem. We'll, we'll begin with a little bit of the problem of industrial agriculture. But the main portion of this um, session is to learn about the solutions because, right, we all need to learn what we need to do to transition to more ecological food and farm systems. And we know, and the science tells us, that it's really the transformation to their number of different systems, agroecological systems, regenerative, organic, different uh, parts of the world and different groups call them different things. But the umbrella of ecological food and farm systems is to help improve. It will improve our natural resources, our soils, our water, our air, so that we better secure food and water systems as an adaptation in climate chaos, right? We need more climate resistant ecological food and farm systems. In addition to that, there are many co-benefits. We, we know we're including in ecological systems, especially in agroecology, that addresses cultural norms and patterns. It also addresses socioeconomic issues and equity. And um, we believe this is all important. It's in contrast to the industrial system, which does not address those things and is more global instead of giving um, control to local communities. A final aspect then that um, of doing ecological food and farm systems, again, science tells us if you build your healthy soil through ecological systems, then you can actually draw down existing carbon from the atmosphere and put it back into the soil where that needs to be. So it's a really important solution, we feel too. Um, Finally, at the end of the session, there'll be a screen. We're also, while we're talking about the ecological solutions, we're also talking about false solutions. And right now here at this um, COP27, the USDA has come peddling a new solution, which they call Aim for Climate. But we know it's just more of the same business as usual, industrial agriculture. It's actually enhancing it. It's providing more GMOs. It's more artificial intelligence, robotics. It's exactly the opposite direction of where we want to go um, for a cl more climate and food secure future. So our panel today, um, I will... Uh, Oh, sorry. I have their bios on my phone. I apologize. It's very small. So I'll start to read those. Right here, we have the founder of ICCA, Andrew Kimbrell. He is an internationally recognized NGO leader, public interest attorney, public speaker, and author. He's also the founder and director of the Center for Food Safety which is the leading food environment NGO in the United States. He is the founder and director of the International Center for Technology Assessment and also the Earth Advocacy Institute. Additionally, he serves as the president of the board of the Humane Farm Animal Welfare. And Kimbrell has been leading efforts to address climate crisis for over 35 years. He founded the Greenhouse Crisis Foundation in 1988, and this was the first U.S. nonprofit solely to address cli the climate issue. So he's been doing this for quite a while. <laughs> so, yes. Um, next, we have Million Belay, Dr. Million Belay. Um, Again, I apologize, I can barely see. Founder of Melka in Ethiopia. 
and the coordinator of the Alliance for Food Sovereignty in Africa, AFSA. Million is an expert and advocate for forestry conservation, indigenous livelihoods, and food and seed sovereignty. Uh, Melka, Ethiopia was created as an indigenous NGO working group and intergenerational learning conservation of forests and improving the livelihoods of people. So welcome, you've been very on the pulse of what's happening at COP, so you might wanna also talk about that as well when you give your presentation. And then we have, we're very, very pleased to have Dr. Ahmad El Hazli. He's the director of the Office of Sponsored Programs and Centers at the Heliopolis University uh, and sustainable, for Sustainable Development and Associate Professor of Marine Geology, Genealogy, sorry. <laughs> He's an oceanographer department at, at Alexandria University. Um, he has been, had a PhD in 2016 for a joint supervision program between Alexandria University in Egypt and the University of Sassari in Italy. So welcome so much. We're really pleased to have someone who's really on the ground here with, in Egypt. And finally, we have Nagla Ahmed. Nagla is um, uh, from an Egyptian Biodynamic Association manager and she's an experienced in agricultural and social development in rural communities and supporting conversion into organic agriculture and working with farmers in the field. So this is so important to what we're talking about today. So welcome panel. Um, we're going to begin. So my understanding is the video, we're not gonna begin with that. Okay, we can't use that. Um, we'll begin with Andrew Kimbrell, going to be talking. Hello, everybody. Can you hear me? You may regret that in a short period of time. Um, thank you, Debbie. Yeah, I've been working on this for 35 years. Uh, we finally did get in 2007 the United States Supreme Court uh, to hold in a five to four decision that there was such a thing as the climate crisis and that they had to regulate greenhouse gases. So that was a big celebration. But why in the heck did it take till 2007 for our Environmental Protection Agency to admit that the problem exists and work on it? So like a lot of you, we have some work to do in, uh, in the United States. I have been working on this for 35 years, but I've also been working with you for 30 years uh, in globalization and other issues, Debbie, and uh, many of my great comrades, my old friends. Uh, we had, so this is 2008, I think, in South Africa, right? And our new friends, that they were doing such amazing work. I'm such a big fan of biodynamics, so I'm thrilled to be with you guys here as well. Um, by the way, you were a teenager, I think, when we started, Debbie, so I don't want people to get the wrong idea here. I, that's, 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 I think it was even, was there a labor relations problem you were so wrong? It was something went on, I don't remember, something, something that wasn't kosher there. Um, yeah, so I was just at the uh, Bloomberg Green, don't ask me why, I'm blaming my friend and co-founder of ICCA, Randall Hayes there, Dr. Randall Hayes, the founder of Rainforest Action there, he dragged me there yesterday. And so we started talking about industrial agriculture. And I think this is gonna be familiar to all of us. They said, well, you know, we know there's problems with it, but how are we gonna feed the world? We know there's problems, but can we merge that industrial agriculture system into new systems, you know? Isn't that the best way? And so there's a lot of confusion about industrial agriculture. What does sustainable mean? What does regenerative mean? Are they industrial agriculture? So I found you know, that, that I thought there might be a need for clarification. So here's my attempt at it. You'll be the judge of whether you think I've succeeded in making it clearer or even worse. Um, so what I decided to do is, um, Take a look at industrial agriculture in light of the eight essentials that it takes to grow a crop. I thought that was a good place to start, right? What does it take to actually grow a crop for, you know, for us, for the humans to use? So I don't know, who's, is somebody clicking something? Do I have a clicker? Oh, yeah. So um, does anybody know what this is? Okay, this is the traditional symbol for the seed, right? Now, we were really going to start this with a beautiful clip from our dear friend, Vana Shiva, my, our colleague for so many years. Um, and of course, seeds and Vandana got together. So that's the 
And notice that the seed is supposed to be what's in the middle. And so all around it, the seed is, seeds are beautiful, first of all, quite often. They're often nutritious to eat, but we know that the real thing about a seed doesn't exist except for the community around it. Now, in many indigenous and vernacular uh, cultures, the seed is sacred, but so is the whole community around it. What does it take for that seed to actually do what it's supposed to do? So here you go. Here are your eight elements and basically the community that the sacred community for many of us that allows the seeds to be the full potential, reach their full potential. Soil. See, sometimes I don't do this. I ask the audience to come up with the eight, but we don't have that time today. So we're gonna just go here, spoiler, spoiler alert. Soil, water, seed, air, sun, pollinator, farmer animals and farmer. That's the eight essentials, right? So you can go to the next one, go to the next one. Here they are in, in more colorful form. So the one way to look at industrial agriculture is, is how's it doing? Now remember, these are the eight essentials. This is the basis of food security. No argument, empirically evident, no, not, not, not to, no disputing it, right? This is it. So our food security, our survival, long-term, short-term, depends on these eight essentials. So let's take a look at how industrial agriculture is doing. In honor of Vandana, who we hope to hear heard from, we didn't, but we, uh, we're gonna start with a seed. So how are we doing with seed? How's industrial agriculture doing with seed? Great, lots of diversity. We all know that's not true. Tremendous monocultures. We've lost 90 to 90% of our fruit and vegetables varieties, right? 15 crops make up 90% of the world's energy take, right? A complete corporate takeover. We know these seeds have been patented, not just in the US, but around the world, it's totally owned by the corporations. 66% of all seeds are now owned and patented by three companies. So we have complete corporate ownership, lack of diversity, and non-transparent understanding of what they're doing with those seeds. So it's, it's a disaster. But more than that, the seed has always been sacred as the symbol of life. But because of what they've done in these patented seeds, they really have become agents of death. These seeds are coated with neonics, with, with insecticides, and they are made genetically engineered to resist huge amounts of poisonous toxic herbicides. So in this peer-reviewed study, a single uh, corn kernel will kill a songbird. Will kill a songbird, one kernel. Because of all the fungicides and insecticides coating it like an M&M, &M, like a poisonous M&M, &M, if you will. And plus, of course, all the cancer, all the destruction of endangered species that are happening because of the massive use of herbicides and GMOs. And by the way, 95% of GMOs, they don't feed anybody. They're, they are basically there to resist the herbicides and therefore infinitely more use of herbicides by Monsanto, Syngenta, and the rest of them. Next. All right, so much for seeds, but maybe we're doing better with water. Maybe the industrial system is doing a lot better with water. We know that's not true. We know that one third of the world's land surface and nearly 70% of fresh water resources are used up by agriculture and livestock. We know that we are facing a huge water shortages. I hope you all saw the CNN international program on the six great rivers of the world all of them in extreme crisis, extreme crisis. The Colorado River in the United States doesn't even make it to its outlet in Pacific. Disastrous water shortages. People are predicting water wars, right? The Agalala Aquifer, which is the basis of water in the United States, you see it right there, is right now it's using the equivalent of 18 Colorado rivers. It's one third depleted. The estimate is if we were to stop using it altogether, it would take 1,500 years to resupply it. That's pretty disastrous. And then of course, even worse is the water contamination. In some ways, you'll see that second one down. We found that, that, we, that there is uh, herbicide contamination in 70% of all of our rivers. So it's not only that we are using it far faster than it can regenerate itself, we're also poisoning that which is left. Not good. Next. Now, I'm getting a little discouraged here, but maybe we'll do better with soil. We know that's not true. We know that we're using soil 10 to 50 times faster than it can be replaced, right? This is an international crisis. 
the United Nations is beginning to use terms like soil extinction. Think about that. Think about soil extinction in the next 50 years. And of course, in our theme of Fatal Harvest, which is a book that I edited many years ago, it isn't just the horrifying topsoil loss, which also, by the way, means no water retention and um, massive flooding, but also fertilizers to try and make up for this lost nitrogen. We know that they use synthetic fertilizers and what do synthetic fertilizers create? Remember the fatal harvest theme? Dead zones, massive dead zones around the world of, in the United States equal to the size of many states. So you see a theme here, right? Death of diversity, right? We're saying water shortages. By the way, you know, we, we can live a long time without food. You can only live about three days without water. And now we're seeing this horrifying topsoil loss, which again is fundamental. Okay, let's go to the next one. Air. Well, we know that massive herbicide drift is happening all over the world. Uh, we uh, notice Roundup, we've, done, we've litigated on this. We've successfully stopped the approval of dicamba because dicamba is a terrible herbicide that under warm and rainy conditions reconstitutes, revolatilizes, travels miles, and then comes down on your organic farm and kills everything there, right? We also know that part of this air pollution is exactly what we're here to talk about, is the methane, the nitrous oxide, which are far more potent than carbon, that are created through fertilizers and, and, and through, um, well, we'll get to it, through animal factories. So, yeah, so the air has also become totally polluted next. Sun, well, sun, of course, is magic. Sun creates photosynthesis, right? Sun is absolutely essential for the whole thing. Gotta happen, sun, right? But the reason that we're all here, through climate change, sorry, through the climate crisis, never call it climate change, May, way too mild. Climate crisis or climate chaos. Um, we realize that crops, the photosynthesis stops, what degree? When does photosynthesis stop, anybody know? In the high 90s, Photosynthesis begins to stop, and by 104, it stops altogether. You cannot grow anything over 104 degree temperature that involves photosynthesis. Zero. Not going to happen. Next. Pollinators. One, one out of every four bites of food relies on pollinators. Take a look at loss of bees. 96% crash of bumblebees. Huge colony collapse, not just in the United States, but around the world. There are countries in the world where people are pollinating because it's because of pesticide use and habitat loss. We've, we were able to get endangered species protection of monarchs, my organization, uh, through, um, through the Endangered Species Act in the United States. Right now, we're trying to get rid of these neonicotinoids, these systemic neo neurotoxin, nicotine-based pesticides that are killing all the bees. Um, and of course, it's, it's the massive herbicides used on GMOs that are killing all the monarchs. So it's a disaster for the pollinators. Farm animals. We, of course, need farm animals for nitrogen in a rotational relational farm system. They're good. We need them. Good idea. Very bad idea to put them in these horrific, horrific animal factories. Not only is it incredibly cruel, but it also means that there's these huge methane lagoons. So instead of being giving us our, the nitrogen we need, they're producing massive amounts of methane, massive amounts of methane, which, as you know, is far more potent than carbon dioxide. And I'm not even going to get into the monopolies, the, 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 the patenting of, ge of genetically engineered animals. But again, just in the sheer cruelty of what we do to the 10 billion land animals we use in the United States each year, and the fact that they're a massive contributor to the climate crisis, um, it's a catastrophic result for, for, the, for the animals that we use in our, in, our, in our agriculture. Next. And of course, farmers. The United States. Um, we're down to less than 2% of our population farmers as monocultures take over. We lose our farm communities. They're devastated. The average age of a farmer in the United States is 58 years old. Farmers have the highest rate of suicide in the United States by far. I think many of you have heard Vandana Shiva talk about suicides in India. I'm sure you've seen that happening all over the world, this massive suicide as they're removed from their farms where they were growing, they were their food independent, right? They moved off those farms for commodity crops like GMO maize, like soy. They they're forced into the tent cities, Addis Ababa, Bhopal, Mexico cities, where then they make 10 cents an hour and the United Nations says, now we move them out of poverty. That has to be the most evil, cruel jokes. Here they are on their land, independent, small and medium landowners, and they're kicked off their land 
usually because of corruption and because they're, they, they're trying to make money on these commodity crops. And because we then make a small amount of money and they don't have food independence, they can't even buy their food. Oh yeah, we've moved them out of poverty. Obviously gets my blood pressure up. Um, yeah, so it's, it's catastrophic, the loss of, uh, so th there you have it. That's the eight elements. Our food security, our livelihoods, short and long-term. Industrial agriculture isn't just a disaster for one or two or four. It's a disaster for all eight. So this is a dead paradigm walking. It's a dead paradigm, just like fossil fuels. There's no future in it, zero future, no defense, not gonna feed the world, it's gonna destroy the world. I don't just call it a dead paradigm, I call it a zombie paradigm because it's still destroying everything. It's dead, but it's still eating up our soil, our water and everything else. And by the way, through the pesticides, yes, even the brains of our children because of pesticide and neonicotinoid poisoning. So, yeah, these are zombie elements, uh, z z zombie paradigms that we're seeing. So one of the things we're trying to do with the International Coalition on Climate and Agriculture is get to a tipping point, and none of us have done this. You're all doing great work, as we're all trying to do great work, everybody here, but we have not yet gotten to the public in general that in industrial agriculture is just as much a criminal in the killing of the planet as fossil fuels. The companies that are involved are just as guilty. They should be just as targeted. And they should be targeted by civil disobedience, we should talk about litigation, legislation, right? NDCs here should not just be dealing with energy. They should be dealing with a transformation from industrial agriculture to agroecological principles, what we call ecological farming, lots of different names for it, right? That is essential. We haven't gotten there, right? Look, even at, even at this cop, not that much. So that's a really big job. But we, I know we're all doing, but we really got to somehow find a better way of communicating that industrial agriculture is an equal villain in the climate crisis. So what's the solution? Well, we're going to hear a lot more of the solution. I'll give you a really quick thing that we do that kind of, because I'm obviously like organized thinking here. So we've talked about what does it mean to go ahead? What's the future look like? Because sometimes people aren't familiar with agroecological principles. And there's some magnificent papers I know Milian, I know how many of you all have done this, but really simple, this is the way I put it. Ecological farming means farming based on agroecological principles, which have to include the broad, B-R-O-A-D approach, B-R-O-A-D, the broad approach to the future, right? The first is biodiversity. And that means not just biodiversity for our seeds, but by protecting the biodiversity of non-food plants, of non-food animals, the biodiversity of the planet. Second one is regenerative. We know the bad guys use regenerative, but it's a really essential word. As long as we're under agroecological principles, I think it's important to use regenerative. And the reason for that is the simple idea that anytime you use any element of nature faster than it reproduces, you end up with scarcity and extinction. Let me repeat that. Anytime you use any element of nature faster than it can regenerate, anytime, it's a law. There's no, no, no way out of it. Anytime you do that, you will have scarcity and extinction. So we have to have regenerativity as the basis for our economy because it's the basis of ecology. Our economies and our agriculture have to be wholly owned subsidi subsidiaries of ecology. No element of nature, no element of nature reproduces versus supply and demand. The tuna fish don't haven't read Adam Smith. They haven't read von Hayek. They haven't read Milton Friedman. They don't know more people want tuna fish sandwiches. They reproduce, the water reproduces, the trees reproduce, the fish reproduce according to their ecological regenerative capacity. That has to be our basis. That's the R. O is organic, no pesticides, no GMOs, none of the agritech thing that Tom Vilsack here is trying to get more billions of dollars and more countries to agree to, right? Organic, we fought a lot. And by the way, protection of soil, right? A, A stands for appropriate scale, not talked about enough. These people know it better than anyone. You cannot have food sovereignty. You cannot have a diverse, small, and medium landowners producing the food we need without appropriate scale. No monocultures, no vassals. D, democracy. Democracy knows corporate patenting, no corporate ownership. You cannot have food security. You cannot have food sovereignty if you don't have democratic principles and accountability. We have to break that corporate hold. Remember, three companies now own and patent 60%, 66% of the world's seeds. That's got to stop, right? We can't have that. So the democratic principles are not just 
abstract political ideas, they're essential for this work. So that's it for me, except one more thing. Would you please stand up in the back? Taylor? Julia? Okay, first of all, thank you guys for all the work you're doing to make this possible. Really appreciate it. Next, I'm really hoping that everybody in this room is gonna sign on to our petition that we're circulating all around this, this conference, oppose Tom Vilsack's $8 billion aim for climate, which is based in agri-tech. He says GMOs, nano, just as Deborah's, Debbie was saying, right? Robotics, artificial intelligence sensors is, is, is the answer. We know that's part of the problem, not part of the solution. Hopefully you'll sign up. They can help you with that. Uh, if, and uh, it's, it's really essential because if this is not our food future, if the broad principles are not a food future, we don't have a future. End of story. Thank you. Okay, thanks for the bad news, but we all needed to hear that. <laughs> okay, now that we're understanding and have a more complete picture or the bigger picture of the problems of what we have now and the, where, we got it, where we have to transition to, We'll hear from Milio next, um, who will have examples of communities throughout Africa who have really um, are changing, who are making the change. And, and if you could address, you know, tell us a bit about those communities and like I say, any other things that might be happening here at, at COP that might be hopeful toward uh, transitioning away from industrial systems to ecological systems, or perhaps there's not enough being done here. So. Um, Go ahead and take it on. Thank you, Milian. Thank you very much, Debbie. Thank you, Andrew. Yes, we met in 2008. Uh, by the way, uh, you see Mamadou Goita there. Uh, Mamadou was also in that meeting. And it's in that meeting that the Alliance for Food Sovereignty in Africa was born. Yeah, so um, the Alliance for Food Sovereignty in Africa is uh, the biggest alliance in Africa. We have uh, close to 40 members now, uh, representing close to 200 million Africans from all walks of life. We have uh, farmer networks, fisher folk networks, pastoralist networks, um, indigenous peoples networks, women networks, youth networks, civil society networks, um, and also consumer networks. So it's big. And out of the 55 African countries, our members work in 50 of them. So that's HAFSA. Um, the center of our work is transition to agroecology. Agroecology is very much important for us uh because um i think before we started uh to to campaign for agroecology in 2013 we have asked ourselves does agroecology work in africa and to to answer that question we started to do research we did research um and you can go to our website and you can find out the uh, case studies that we did and there are over 100 case studies and also deeper level of research also to answer that question we looked also the, the research outcomes of other institutions including the uh, international panel of experts on the sustainability of food i pays food so the amount of research done in uh, on agroecology is increasing and the data is increasing so agroecology works we see uh, agroecology for Africa also as a resistance, as a form of resistance, uh, because you know we we there is a his, why everybody is asking you know if Africa has um, the fertile land you know the uh, the most fertile land in the world and if there are people who can farm it um, and and if there are other resources the weather is fine. Why is it not Africa feeding itself? You know, that's a very big question. And the answer is historical. Before the advent of the first arrival of European ships, 
on the shores of Africa, Africans were feeding themselves. There was a governance system that was working. There was a trade system that was working. The system is working as well documented. Then the, then the, the European uh, ships have arrived and they turned agriculture into commodity-based agriculture, producing food for, for outside, you know. And there was, as you know, there was slave, slave trade. Um, the bigger force of Africans were taken there, out of Africa to, 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 to do farming in other continents. Then colonialism came in that reorienting of African agriculture into commodity form of agriculture has continued. We're producing again for, for other continents. Then post-independence also, it didn't stop up to now up to now. There are philanthro capitalists, companies, um, corporations, uh, governments, our governments, research institutes all over the world, still focusing Africa or leading or transforming African agriculture to industrial form of agriculture or conventional form of agriculture a, in, in the form of um, uh, the Green Revolution, the Green Revolution agenda. We all know what has happened because of the Green Revolution agenda. Uh, we know what has happened in India, in, in, in Mexico, in other parts of, of the country, but it has been tried also in Africa by the Alliance for Green Revolution in Africa, and it has failed. It has failed spectacularly. And they have succeeded in doing some things, which is bad for us, which is changing the laws, seed laws, seed regulations, laws related to land acquisition, laws related to uh, agricultural inputs, you know? So the bad thing is they have succeeded. So they, they haven't succeeded in reducing poverty. They haven't succeeded in reducing malnutrition, increasing the income of local communities, but they have succeeded in uh, destroying the farming base of, of the communities and the erosion of local seeds and local culture is astounding. So that's the bad thing, you know? What we are promoting is agroecology. Why are we promoting agroecology, especially in the context of uh, the climate crisis? First, it builds resilience into the system. Cyclone Ida uh, has hit uh, Zimbabwe, as you know. After Cyclone Ida, uh, there was a research. There was a research done um, to compare how conventional farmers and agroecological farmers have fared. And you could see that you know, the, the level of soil erosion in agroecological farms is much, much less than conventional farms. And the communities were together. It was very easy for them to come back again and uh, rehabilitate themselves. The togetherness of the community was much better in agroecological farms. And they can, they, they, their soil is good, so they can also quickly come back, you know? So uh, resilience is built. I think there was research done in Cuba, in other countries, which proved that agroecology actually builds resilience. Agroecology increases productivity, you know, we call the Green Revolution approach, a productivist approach, because they day and night they talk about producing food, huh? producing more food. Yes, more food is important, but you can get that through agroecology. That's proven. That's how what we have proved. Agroecology is important also for the environment, you know, because it's based on diversity. It builds the soil. It builds the water system. So it's a fantastic adaptation mechanism. If we want to adapt to the climate crisis that we have, we have to follow our adaptation. I mean, uh, agroecology. I think I can give you a few examples. One example is what has happened in Kenya. I like this example because it connects consumers and, uh, and producers. You know, because of the continuous advocacy from uh, traditional healers, people who are using traditional food, then people have, to, have started to demand leafy vegetables, leafy vegetables. Then 
the supermarkets start to hold leafy vegetables, they start to, to sell. Because of that, farmers start to produce leafy vegetables. So the production of leafy vegetables, which was downgraded to due to, due to, uh, during the colonial time, has increased. And since they are planting leafy vegetables, the farmers themselves, the nutrition at the household level has increased also. So that's one example where the demand from the consumer side has encouraged agroecological production. The second example is, is from uh, Malawi. In Malawi, I think that the main meal is basically maize, but the maize is accompanied by a number of other, other herbs, other leaves. So um, two individuals went to Malawi and they started to start uh, permaculture. So the question was, are there leafy, leafy vegetab vegetables to, to be eaten in Malawi? And they had a meeting with elders, women elders. And the women elders have identified more than 300 leaves to be planted, to be eaten. So they started to plant those, uh, those plants in the, in the, in the, in the permaculture uh, gardens. So the number of food has increased in the farm. So without importing food, so it is possible. The third example is uh, what has happened in, in Ethiopia. You know, the system of rice intensification. System of rice intensification actually was started in uh, Madagascar. And it's planting rice on a line, you know, without, uh, without broadcast, broadcasting. So that has increased the productivity significantly. So some scientists in Ethiopia, especially the Institute for Sustainable Development in Ethiopia, the Swedes. So they started to use to use the system through crops. So system of crop intensification. And F, F is a very critical crop in, in Ethiopia. We have over 60 varieties of F in Ethiopia. So they started. To, 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 to apply it on TEF. So they, they started to plant TEF online. What has happened? I think productivity has increased threefold. What does it mean in terms of income? They say that on average from any farm, you get uh, I mean, from one hectare, you get 10 quintals. One quintal of TEF right now is probably 2,000, 3,000. 3,000 times 10 is? 30,000, if they can increase their productivity threefold, it means getting how many quintals? 30 quintals, you know? So, so the, the amount of money that, that they get is how much then? 90,000. This is a significant income increase, just only by changing the management of how to plant crops without applying any fertilizer or pesticides and whatever. A last example that I give is uh, again from uh, North Ethiopia, from Ethiopia. There was an experiment uh, by uh, the Institute for Sustainable Development. The experiment was over five crops, uh, maize, uh, teff, wheat, barley, and uh, beans. So there was one plot uh, for control with no application of any kinds of fertilizers. Another plot with artificial fertilizers and another one with compost. And with this is um, increasing the soil and soil conservation, planting uh, grasses and trees to increase the plant biomass for, for compost. So the third one was, was, was treated with compost. For the first two, three years, yes. The land which was treated with artificial fertilizer did better. But slowly and surely, compost started to, to catch up. So for all of the crops, for all of these five critical crops, land treated with compost, but in combined with soil and water conservation activities and increasing the, the plant biomass works. So in general, agroecology agro increases productivity, is good for nutrition because it's based for uh, on the diverse crops. It's very much good for the soil, for the environment in general, very much good for the society because people come 
together in agroecological farming areas. And it's fantastic for resilience. In resilience is based on, on, on diversity. So agroecological farms out of the 17 SDGs, 11 of them, it meets 11 of them. Uh, when I say that to the university in the US, and they said, why not to all of them? It's actually, it takes all of the SDGs. And thank you very much again. Thank you. So the, it's nice to hear the good news <laughs> and the way we can go and the way it can be. And we're gonna hear more of what's happening, similar stories out of Egypt. So, and we're so thrilled. They're going back. Yeah. Sorry. Anyway. Um, and so. <laughs> yeah. We, we have one mic here and then, yeah, we can share because we will we, we'll not speak at the same time. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> we'll start with Ahmed. Yes. And thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Debbie. And thank you for the invitation. Um, Actually, um, I will speak from my perspective. I'm an academician and I'm uh, now leading the research in the community service centers and the projects at Heliopolis University for Sustainable Development, uh, which is uh, the educational component of SACEM. Of course, you know SACEM, it is uh, the first initiative at the uh, Middle East um, to promote the sustainable development in the holistic approach, the four main dimensions of the life the society, the economy, the ecology, and the culture uh, integrated together for a better life uh, for uh, the human beings. Uh, I will not go deeply in the agriculture because you are experts in agriculture, but I want to, to highlight something, and this is the message I'm delivering in every panel, every dialogue, every thing I'm getting on in, in this COP, um, nothing will happen without the education and the research. And the, the hope is in the youth. They are the future implementers. They are the future leaders. They are the decision makers in the future. So if you want to change from the industrial agriculture to ecological agriculture or ag agroecology, if you want to change from organic, from the conventional ways of agriculture to the biodynamic or organic agriculture, who will do this? The young people, the youth, the young generations who will implement this in the future. So I'm speaking and focusing on the role of the universities in the promotion of uh, this concept. Of course, you know, we have the traditional roles of any of any educational system or any university, the education, the research, and the community service. This can be done um, in a traditional way, very traditional way, which will not lead to the desired outcomes or desired outputs, but we can do it in an innovative way. For instance, the education. Education is mainly for the, for the capacity building of the students, uh, is for the integration of the, um, the climate change uh, issues or climate crisis issues in the uh, syllabus, in the curriculum, unfolding the potential of the students, um, giving them or providing them with the required skills, knowledge, competences for the future. This, is, this can be the role of the university. The research, focusing on the applied research, the research that can be implemented on the ground. The research, not only for scientific publication to have a paper published, no. Research based on the, on the real um, conditions, real experiments. And um, I will highlight something at the end of my, my talk and my colleague Nagla will give you, because she's the one who is working on the ground with uh, the farmers, with uh, the, um, the people on the ground. And finally, the community service. Community service is very important. And it is, this role is um, a little bit absent in many universities. Um, how to engage uh, the community in what are you doing? How to link the academia with the community? How to give the technical support 
for the uh, for the farmers, for the uh, industry, for anything. How to how to raise the awareness about the agroecology, about um, anything we want to to do. So I think this is most important. And um, as Sekem uh, was a, a pioneer in the sustainable development and of course in organic agriculture and biodynamic agriculture and agroecology. Also, it was a pioneer in, in the field of the education. In um, 2007, Heliopolis University for Sustainable Development, the first university at the Middle East, in the Middle East, uh, which focused or which put the sustainable development in the core of its mission, vision, strategic goals and, um, and objectives. Um, we have the Faculty of Organic Agriculture, which is the first faculty for organic agriculture in Egypt. And as well, we have um, the vision of SACEM, which is summarized in 70, 16 SACEM vision goals that are consistent and coherent with uh, the SDGs, the United Nations SDGs. And to implement these uh, SACEM vision goals and to help in the implementation and the achievement of, of sustainable development goals of the United Nations, we have seven centers, seven research and community service centers serving those objectives. One of them is Center of Organic Agriculture. Another one is Carbon Footprint Center. And by the research in the Carbon Footprint Center, we, do, we developed um, an idea, a research, um, a real research based on the, uh, the activities that we, we run in the ground about the agricultural carbon credits. Of course, if you go to the uh, uh, simple farmer and you want to ask him to do some uh, practices in order to save the environment and to help uh, in the climate change mitigation, of course, he will not understand that. You have to give him some incentives, right? To, to, to do what, what you want, what you, what you can see that is uh, proper. So we developed the approach, SACEM approach in agriculture, which is composed by, by four main components. The first one is the organic agriculture, or biodynamic, biodynamic agriculture, where you have a healthy soil that is sequestered and capture carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and put it in the soil. Second, the afforestation. You plant trees in your farm. This is as well capture and sequester carbon dioxide from, that, from the atmosphere. Third one, not to use the, um, in the um, pesticide or uh, sorry, fertilizers, the uh, industrial fertilizer, you use compost. We are using the compost from the agriculture and the animal wastes and this, not sequester carbon dioxide, but, but it, uh, it, it is uh, the avoidness of the emissions of carbon dioxide because you are using the waste of animals and you uh, stop the production of the uh, new fertilizers. And finally, using the renewable energy uh, instead of the uh, diesel and fossil fuels. Um, and by this, the farmer, if he implements this, he will have extra income by having the certification, certificates of the carbon credits. And then he will help directly and indirectly in the climate change mitigation. And the third thing that after some time, you will have the biodynamic and organic products uh, not so expensive because this approach will give some extra income for the farmers. So um, I think this is the real research we want. And the good thing that this approach started to be um, common in Egypt, we are working on around uh, with 2,000 farmers and we are expecting to upscale this to 40,000 farmers next uh, three years. But the good thing that the day before yesterday, the prime minister of Egypt announced the first carbon market, voluntary carbon market in Egypt, uh, the carbon, ex uh, carbon exchange in the uh, Egyptian stock exchange. 
and we were the driver of that of that and we gave we i mean SACEM, Heliopolis University, Egyptian Biodynamic Association. We gave the technical support needed for the Egyptian uh, stock exchange to have this platform and to have this on the ground. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, Nagla, welcome so much. And um, yeah, I was just gonna say, there's gonna be Q and A after Nagla. So we'll all come engage with one another and it'd be great to hear your stories of success too. and and we'll share information. But we're really excited to hear about what's happening on the ground with Egyptian farmers. Uh, first of all, hello to all. And uh, thank you for inviting me to attend this session and to give a speech. Um, I will not talk in a slogan way or in a, uh, initiatives and the things are written in books, but we will reflect what's on the ground from the people and from the practical side. Um, let me start first of what is the true cost accounting we are paying to have our food inside our body. My voice is clear for all. Okay. Um, so uh, we are paying euro or 20 pounds, but this is not the real accounting. This is not the real price. The real price is what we are choosing to pay for just to protect my body from diseases, to enhance my immunity. And this is what we learned since three years now, while we talked with the COVID. Then we have to return to the nature, to the agroecology and the herbs and medicinal plants, which raising the immunity, not only the medicines, because all of a sudden we found that medicines prices had been increased and it's not available inside the pharmacies. Uh, we cannot find Doctors in time, we, yani, we have to refer to our mother nature. So from this point, we would start for reflecting the true cost accounting of the crop or the food we are buying, which is, should be organic, clean, sustainable. And I can trust the source of whom I am buying his product. Just I feel that it's okay for me and okay for my family. This is number one. Then this is a call for the agroecology in agriculture. If to address this point, uh, we will start from the start of the farmer, who is the beginning of the value chain of the food system. He doesn't care at all about agroecology, environment, climate change. All these are very huge terms. He's not understanding. And to make it clear for him, he has to be like, uh, a, a friend. It's a, a campaign to, aware, to raise the awareness of those farmers, not only from, for myself and not only from himself. It's for the community. It's, it's a global issue now. Uh, even though I, I have to say that uh, the conventional farmer, if he spread the pesticides for uh, an infection, he protects some lines from his land just to be produced clean without pesticides. This is for his family. The surrounding area is full of pesticides, but the food for his family is organic totally. Can you imagine this, this, this concept? So to raise the, that he will use the inside and the entire areas, it has to be certain actions. So I want my colleagues and I will not uh, address the climate change in terms of carbon credits. Now I will reflect it later, but I will talk about actions and solutions. Just to summarize what we can do all together. We are from different countries, but we have the same problems. We are having different cultures, but we have the same concept of problems, which is can be defined. Inflation in prices, inflation in uh, uh, the input supplies material, which can the farmer use to cultivate? Uh, so how can we help in this? We are all representing different entities, government, NGOs, uh, donors, uh, funding agencies, bankers, activists, even we are individuals, but at least to start with the oneself. If you will not start with ourselves, no one can believe. Sekam already started since 45 years and no one was in belief at all that organic agriculture might be a driver in Egypt 
now after the 45 years and after starting with 10 farmers, then a big success to have 70 farmers, then all over a sudden after 40 years, 500 farmers only cultivating organic. You imagine that all over 45 years. Now we are addressing 2000 farmers. And by 2023, we will address 40,000 farmers. Why? All are learning by shock. Excuse me, Dr. Ahmed. People is not educating by just an education, but they learning by shock. If we have the shock, we will all change our directions, our minds. We have to find some solutions. So now we are turning to the agroecology, the nature, the biodiversity. All those terms now will be very well understood to a lot of us and the farmers even. Now they will believe how I can market my clean food for myself and to sustain my farm, how I can find support, how can I market my products in the local market, it's not for export, but all the world now needs to export just to get the foreign currencies to enhance the economic level of the, of the country. Uh, then there is a movement has to be done or alliances or clusters. We have to exchange with each other's experiences, starting from farming, seeds, as, as you mentioned, the seed sources might be you find you have at your end some seeds of certain variety which can be adapted in my country. And especially in Africa, we have the same atmosphere and the, the same climate that we can exchange some things to be produced at our ends. Uh, also, the concept of innovations. Why don't we try some demo plots, prototype to be done in different areas in, in, from the north to the south? and to be documented by videos, by, by any way, which can be reflected to the community. This is the success. We don't want to focus on problems only, on failures of what had been done. Now we need to save the future and the sustainable food. Now after the wars, each country is focusing how I can secure my own food, the wheat, the rice. Now we have all the same problems each country, even the economic level is, is, is higher. But how I can secure my food? Hunger is a big issue. How we can secure this? So it has to be like an intensive work since the beginning of the development. Although there was a, an old belief that uh, uh, development is compatible with climate change, but it's now proved the opposite. All working together, aligned together. So uh, 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 what I can recommend is that uh, we work with the farmer in uh, uh, synergies of different activities, prototype uh, 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 farming uh, with new innovations, uh, uh, making some things available for him, the alternative of the conventional fertilizers, the conventional pesticides, which already cause lots of pollutions now we have you talked about the pollution of water which is by default now is existing in different areas in egypt especially the north the delta which is polluted by default how can we work on this exchange time by time and at the same time we have to direct to the clean virgin land of the desert which need much more investment in fertilizers but it's 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 I, I think it's it's a plan how to plan to produce our own food in a sustainable way, not to just run and do something and then it's not sustainable and it doesn't work and we invested in the wrong side. Uh, also, I recommend something um, is that um, uh, some policies has to be addressed. This is not only the private sector role, and this is not the farmer role, and this is not only the cooperatives, the non-formal initiatives, um, the movements. It, it's not only the roles. The government has to, to start. And as Dr. Ahmed mentioned, like the initiative, we have been working on this carbon issue since many years, and already it has been applied in SICAMS, internal uh, um, uh, lands and farms still prove that it's, it works. It's a closed circle, a benefit for all the, the, the partners in the chain. And now it can be disseminated. 
to all to be announced not only for SECAM and not only for the SECAM farmers, but to benefit the all farmers. And from this point, I would like to highlight something because uh, this is an initiative already where we have been working with other partners that uh, you can offset your carbon emissions now through www.zero.cop27.com. You can offset your travel emissions just to support the Egyptian smallholder farmers through this website. This will return it back to the farmers again uh, in, in, in their uh, uh, benefit. Uh, so there are lots of, of initiatives which can be presented not only to, to our private sector, but, only, uh, but also for recommendations to be presented to the talks in the parliament, in the, in the formal speeches, in the events, in, in, in any something formal that can enhance those people just to support from the policy makers, from the movements, people can, can get action and get, can get into action. Otherwise, we will not be developed. Each one will develop himself, and that's it, and no one will move. Thank you. Thank you for your inspiring work and your words. It's in all of you this really wonderful work, and it shows what, we can, what can be done. So we have about 10 minutes for questions. Um, if you say it, I guess I'll just repeat your question, maybe. Is that, or I could be, yeah, like a, MC, okay. I was about to say maybe there should be a roving mic. Um, thank you, thank you to the uh, presenters to for for that wonderful presentation and the information that came out of it. Uh, my name is Tozi Zokufa, and I'm the executive director of the Coalition of African Animal Welfare Organizations. We're based in Cape Town, South Africa. And I have just two quick ones. Uh, in fact, there's many more, but just to be fair, and in the uh, time management issue. Uh, Do Dr. Million, the, the question is a quick one. How can we decolonize uh, our food production on the African continent? And also that includes agroecology because some of us don't think it's a new concept. It's just given a different name and we think Africans have been doing it all along, by the way. Uh, so now it's owned by others all of a sudden. And then, uh, and then Andrew, uh, we work in an animal sort of space, industrial animal agriculture, and we think that animal welfare is also against industrial animal agriculture, of course, or CAFOs or factory farms. But what we've seen over the past years is that in 2020, only 1 million US dollars was given to farm animal welfare on the African continent compared to 90 million US dollars in the US or 50 million US dollars in EU. Do you then think with that commitment or such commitment in terms of resources, will there be a change in what is happening now on the ground? Meaning industrial animal agriculture is coming our way thick and fast. Thank you. Why don't we go for these two questions answers first and then I'll come back because those are pretty deep questions, I think. Million, do you want to? Yeah, thank you very much. Sure. Hello, 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 hello. Yeah, okay. So, yes, you are right. Um, yes, you are right. It is a kind of agriculture that was practiced by our ancestors, uh, the agroecology. But we are also embracing science, you know, we're not rejecting science. So, agroecology is a, um, a science embracing uh, initiative. What kind of science is a question? Um, how is science conceptualize the question? Uh, because we're talking about the co-creation of knowledge in this case. So we, we have to recognize the knowledge of farmers also. Why agroecology is a bit different is there is a social movement element inside it. There is, a, there is a, you know, it's deliberately that I talked about the historical injustice 
that we are facing, the colonialism. So it's an anti-colonialism initiative, agroecology, it's built into it. Um, so others, when they use the word agroecology, they can use it in their own context. But for Africa, is an anti-colonial movement also. Yeah, um, I have to tell you, there's almost no money spent in the United States on animal welfare. You'll have, we, there's a huge billions of dollars spent on subsidizing animal factories, right? But we have an Animal Welfare Act in the United States that does not include farm animals, zero. We fought for years in our organic standards, which our organization helped create, to get animal welfare standards in. We finally did it. The Trump administration took it out. And we've just spent two years of litigation to try and get it back in. What's happening in the United States that has anything to do with animal welfare has to do with the private sector and labeling. I'm, you know, I'm president of the board of the Humane Farm Animal, right? And that we have our humane animal um, labeling, right? So if you look at, you know, you know, certified humane, that's the organization of, you know, that I helped start because we weren't doing it through government. Some states, yes, a little bit, but federal government, nothing. There's complete commitment to animal factories, no commitment to getting the animals out of those factories and back on relation rotational farming. So it's a big fight. You know, we, we're doing the best we can, but the, don't look to the United States for virtually any real support. The European Union, however, is doing a heck of a lot better job. So I don't know where you got that statistic. I think that may have come from people talking about subsidies for animal factories, which they claim are improving their welfare, but they're not. You know, they are, it's a, it remains a 10 billion animal crime every year in the United States. Yeah, and just to add to that, so the US has a lot of different agencies. And for example, USAID, which does this foreign, almost all of their animal uh, or any kind of assistance as far as livestock is going toward factory farming, animal, big industrial. Um, so you may have one arm of the government saying something good that we're gonna do something good for animal welfare, but in fact, most of the money that's going to foreign countries is going through an agency that is supporting factory farms or encouraging other countries to start factory farms. Sir, I think you had a question. Thank you so much for beautiful presentations. My name is Steven Nirenda from Zambia Climate Change Network. We are a network that has over time been following the issues of agroecology and we are raising enormous awareness campaigns in the communities. Yes, in your presentations, uh, in the conclusion of what you presented, uh, there's something that I, I noted uh, and I need a clarification of what, what you meant. Yeah, and I quote here, it says, significantly increased public education and involvement is required. Now, I, 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 my question is, what kind of education are you talking about? No, it, you know, it is you, you who said in, in your presentation. On public education? Yes. Public. I more that you guys were sort of telling me, I'm happy to talk about public education. Yes. So, so, so now uh, what I'm saying is that there's a lot of resistance from the policymakers to allow agroecology to filter in on a smallholder farmer. Yes. Now, this education that you have talked about here in the conclusion of what you presented is targeting the, the public. Is it not right to educate the policymakers other than the public? Uh, I can only speak for the United States and I can say that with great confidence to everyone in this room, the United States is not a democracy. It's a corporate oligarchy with small democratic things sneaking in at the local level. Every ag policymaker is bought out by, by industrial agriculture. Every state ag committee, federal ag committee, Democrat or Republican makes no difference. They're bought into this terrible you know, zombie paradigm, this dead paradigm. They're staying with it because that's where the money is. Uh, to educate them, to even lobby them is usually a waste of time. We do is we litigate, we sue them. And sometimes that we get very good results from suing them and making them do the right thing. But as far as educating them, right now they're educated by very large amount of money 
including our friend Tom Vilsack, the United States Department of Agriculture, who is raising $8 billion, $16 billion, $24 billion to buy out every university he can to follow what Agra, the nightmare that Agra has been in Africa and put it on steroids around the world so they can make sure that nobody's doing public education, so they can make sure that no government, he's got 42 governments behind him so far, 42. He's got the, the, the endorsement of the president of COP26 and 27. He has 200 companies right now signed up on. You know, you can guess who they are? Monsanto, Syngenta, DuPont, Gates Foundation, Agra, CropLife, FAO, the sellouts of the United Nations, they're all with him. And their job is to stop real public education and to stop governments from investing, instead of taking money for GMOs, everything that you guys are not doing. But why don't you go on with the public education, be a little more pre maybe specific. No, I just want to elaborate and um, agree on with my colleague that um, yesterday I had a session, uh, a panel in the EU pavilion, and we were talking about the science diplomacy, science and innovation diplomacy, and I have raised this issue. I said, although the capacity building of the public and for the young generations and for the people is very important, but the capacity building of the decision makers and decision takers is much more important. So I, I just want to thank you and agree with you about that. Thank you. I can, I can only hope that you have infinitely less corrupt public officials than we do in the United States. I congratulate you if you do, and I, I think educating them would be, um, and if you're successful, could you come to the United States and help us out with all of our corrupt uh, officials who are bought out by the, the big, uh, big ag? That would be great. would love that. Okay, we're winding down here, brother. Okay, thank you. Um, my name is Kennedy Migade uh, from Uganda. Now, um, an advocate of agroecology, and I deal with the youth. Uh, but one time I was challenged uh, where one of the boys asked me about population and demand. Now, with natural, natural things occurring naturally, uh, for example, he gave me an example of chicken. Uh, a local bird uh, takes three months, 90 days or more to start laying eggs. And when it lays eggs, it will lay like 10 to 14 eggs for about 21 days. Now, there is uh, agroecology production, all products versus industrial. Uh, products. The demand is high. The population is increasing. That's the challenge. That however much people would understand to do what we tell them to do. But then there is also demand for food. Okay. Uh, for crops, a bit okay. Because when you manure, uh, organic fertilizers, it works. But then for bad products, animal products, it's a bit tricky. You see that even management is a bit easy in this uh, modern technology. And in our old fashion, uh, our ancient life, the traditional way, even management of animals, uh, Stopping disease, uh, disease control is a bit tricky. So how can we follow up with that? You wanna address that, William? Yeah, I think it's a very good question. Uh, um, but um, I think he was talking about the true cost accounting. At the end of the day, you can have a plenty of food, a big, a big chicken, yeah? After you eat that chicken, what's going to happen to your health is very much important. But productivity is important. And as you are saying, it's very easier to demonstrate that on crops, on plants, uh, basically. But uh, I can assure you that there are a number of farms all over the world who are using agroecological methods also to increase 
the productivity of local chickens. That's one thing. The second thing is also there is the, uh, the genetic diversity of the, the chickens is changing now. You know, there is a lot of breeding among the, the two kinds of uh, where agroecology in the, the broiler kind of uh, raising chickens differs is how you treat the chickens, where you bring in the uh, human rights, I mean, animal rights issues in there, and whether also you have enough area to bring all of them out from the field and eat from the field. So, yeah. Nagla, I think you had something. Yes, what I would like to address here is my colleagues already raised the true cost accounting. And I would like to, to raise just one thing also for the, uh, the rotation of the life cycle of the eggs and the chicken and raising them up is that there are some alternatives of the feed even because we suffered from now in Egypt from the high increase of the chicken prices and even the eggs, you know, we, yani, it's treble the price. If the egg was costing one pound, now it's around three pounds. This is for the normal Egyptian family. If he want to get his dinner with only some eggs, he would pay, and they are four persons, he would pay if, if one get two eggs, just this mean eight on the dinner. This means that he will pay uh, 25 pounds, something 35 pounds. This is unlogical in, in increase in one month. And reasons for the prices, it seems not logical, but if you, this is reveals to some uh, uh, issues also rather than uh, the true cost accounting, it could be from the monopoly of prices uh, from some producers, but some uh, producers suffered from the high increase of the feeds of the chicken. But this needs to search for, again, the innovation innovation of the alternatives and how can this be adapted with the climate and the agroecology. These are things which is not being solved now while we are sitting, but might be this would be a driver for you and someone from here and someone from the live stream of the video to think how he can raise alternative products for the feed of the chicken to all the people. And this could be uh, a trading, yani, something to be sold as reasonable price and good alternative. And just, I just want to quickly add that soy, GMO soy, is feeding the animals in Europe, feeding the animals in the United States. And you know where that soy is coming from? Former rainforest in Brazil. They are destroying acre after millions of acres of the rainforest to plant GMO soy in Bolsonaro, Brazil said for. So what's, how do you put the cost in that? Destroying the rainforest and killing the planet. How much does that egg go up in cost? A zillion dollars, I mean, I, can we even begin to think of that cost? Not just the animal cruelty, it's actually destroying the rainforest. Your eggs are destroying the rainforest. How about that for, you know, that's, that's the true cost we're talking about. It's that clear, I'm not making this up. That's actually true. Your eggs are killing the rainforest. Hopefully, if you tell people that, they'll go for these alternatives. They'll see the incentive, right? Hopefully, they will. And I'll also add that we often talk about this as a economic issue, environmental issue, but I think the food we eat is profoundly moral issue. We cannot merely be consumers. We have to teach everybody in our society, do not be a consumer. Fires consume. Tuberculosis used to be called consumption. Every decision you make, you're creating. You're creating either the dead paradigm that's destroying the earth or the new alternatives, biodynamic agriculture. You, we are all creators, not consumers. That's a horrible way to put us all, consumers. Terrible, De disempowering. No, I don't always, I'm not always on top of the mountain. I'm not preaching that I am. I'm just saying we need to take that accountability. It's a profoundly moral issue, not just about the price of eggs. Yeah, we don't want to destroy the rainforest, but take that. When, when you're taking the cruelty to these animals, the cr unbelievable cruelty of these chickens, or for pigs for that matter, that's, you say, no, we, we wanna have a mutually enhancing relationship with these animals and with the entire living community. How can we feed ourselves in a mutually enhancing way with the rest of the living kingdom of the world? That's our challenge. And that's the challenge we're talking about. And you were addressing, and self-sufficiency in all of this too, right? Which just makes it full circle here. 
So I'm sorry, I think I'm getting the, we have to empty the room, cut it off. But um, just to point out, if you would like to take action against the aim for climate, if your organization would like to sign on, then please uh, go to our website, www.icca.international, or I guess you can use your phone on the QR code in some mysterious way to do that, take you to our website as well. Thank you so much to our panelists so much. And we're um, talking about, uh, should be uplifting for all of us. I mean, uh, the examples you brought are really inspiring. So thank you very much. Thank you, Debbie, for doing this incredible job for not just emceeing, but for really being the moving force behind this. And we also want to mention our wonderful colleague, Lisa Rayburn, you know, who's helped us. But thank you, Debbie, for being the, the leading force on this. As always, uh, you're a miracle. Thank you.